in India, we have participants, uh, participants joining us from different continents. We welcome uh, John from Scotland, very cold, I am sure. And Jay and Joanne from New Zealand. And again, James from America. If you just imagine the timing, for James is 2.30 a.m. in the morning. For John, I think it's at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. And for us, it's one o'clock. And for Jay and Joanne, it is 8.30 p.m. And some of you from different parts of the world. So we welcome you and thank you so much for uh, joining us for this first public lecture. During this lecture, the participants are requested to post their questions or queries or comments in a chat box. We shall try to pick up maybe some of them at the end, towards the end of the program. And so that's how we will do uh, during this uh, lecture. Now, having shared the background of the lecture, I shall now introduce to you our speaker and the respondent. Dr. J. Metanga and his respondent, Dr. Basumatari or Songram Basumatari. Let me start with introducing to you um, Dr. Basumatari. Reverend Dr. Songram Basumatari is currently the Associate Professor and Head of Department of the Theology and Ethics at Gurukul Theological Institute, Chennai. Um, he is the author of the Theology of Identity, published by Peter Lang, Germany. And he also has published many books and articles, both in India and abroad. He has several responsibilities, both in uh, college and also the church. Um, so um, he is very much demanded in the church, also in a theological uh, institution. And last of all, let me say this, that he is from a Boro indigenous community an indigenous scholar, and he's very much part of BKI as a member of academic committee and a strong supporter of BKI. It is appropriate that we have him today to respond to Dr. J um, for us to reflect and take the issues further and hopefully uh, draw insights for the lecture, um, from the lecture to our work here in, in India. Now our speaker, Dr. Matenga, is a Maori indigenous scholar from New Zealand, and he will tell us more about his family background because uh, his presentation uh, includes those things as a, one of the important part of his lecture. So we will wait for him to share about his own background. But let me share a few things about him. <clears throat> Dr. Matenga is a pioneer. And I would add, he's not just a pioneer, he's a daring and risk-taking or a risk-taker, a, a visionary leader. And he's also a scholar, a creative thinker and writer, a blogger, and a publisher. He has uh, um, important responsibilities in different organizations um, of which I would not share. Um, maybe you can read um, about him uh, in the websites, uh, but just, just a few things I want to share. Um, his work evolved into a deep understanding of how to harmonize culturally diverse groups and help people and organizations to thrive 
in the midst of diversity, developing what he calls epistemic hybridity. Epistemic hybridity occur in interculturality. That is a crucial competency for our 21st uh, century uh, global village. So you can see in him uh, uh, a mechanism or, or um, something that connects and binds and, and then bridges differences. So he's, he's a person uh, who has a rich, rich experience working in multicultural context. Now his specialties include ecological organizational development, narrative-based publicity and communications, interpersonal and intercultural relationship, strategy and paradigm modeling, and personal development. All this, all this are salted with theology, sociology, philosophy, singing, songwriting, guitar playing, and creative non-fiction writing. You can see him, a typical indigenous scholar who brings together all these different fields of studies. This is the difference between the so-called, you know, the Western education and indigenous education uh, system, wherein we bring in this different uh, expertise together. So this has shown to us that uh, he is the right person to be the first speaker for the BKI public lecture. Now, finally, before Jay present his thesis or lecture, I just want us to remind ourselves of indigenous people around the world and their common experience. The common experience of the indigenous people around the world is about colonization. Colonization from other parts of the world, colonization from within, and exploitation, denial of human dignity, human rights, and human values. So indigenous people have been the receiving end of all these oppressive ideologies, culture, and faith systems. It is for this reason that we need to share our experience and dialogue and help and encourage one another in the pursuit of faith and in the building of a community that is respecting, embracing, and enhancing each other. Now, with these few words of welcome and introduction, I now invite Dr. Jay Matinga to take his time. Dr. Jay, please, time's yours. Dr. Jankalam, you honor me too much. <laughs> I, all that you said there is, uh, it just means uh, a jack of all trades and a master of, of none. <laughs> but I will, uh, I will do my best. I'm going to share my screen now, everybody. And uh, thank you for that very, very warm welcome. This is a, um, an image you see on the screen there of a typical uh, koru. As a Maori image of um, of new life and expresses balance there in that uh, in that item. I thought I'd share that with you as we start uh, today. So my topic, I'm going to focus it around this idea of indigenous Christ following. But firstly, uh, let me introduce myself. Kia to te auraha. No kia koto me te ranga māori e he, he mia nā te atua, nā tō mātō mātua, nā te ariki hoki, nā ihu karaiti. Grace and peace to you all 
in our God, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Enga rangatira e huhuine, nga mihi nui kia koto kato. Very respected leaders, I greet you all uh, very warmly. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Three times greetings to you all. Let me uh, position myself now as is traditional for us. Ko je matanga aho, ki te iwi ngā te kahungunu ki wararapa moana, te tonga o te ika a Māori. So I am Jay Matanga of the Māori tribe Nga Te Kahungunu of the Lake Wairarapa region at the lower end of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. To he Māori ora. This, this is the vital force of life. Today, the vital force of life comes to us through Kolosa Kotahi, Tiko Marima, Tiko Maofitu. In other words, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 17. Ko uh, i ne te ahua o te atua e kore ne e kitia atu. Ko te whano matamua o ngā mia hangakato. So he, the son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. No mua ano hoki e nga mia katoa. Na na ano hoki nga mia katoa e a mao ai. He is before all things and person that is indigenous to Aotearoa, New Zealand. I am Maori by my father's line. Who, uh, whose father, my paternal grandfather, had only Māori heritage. But I was raised in the home of my mother and stepfather, both of European descent. I was educated as a white person under my stepfather's surname, which I held for the first uh, part of my life. And that I was a white person went without question due to my skin tone and my stepfather's surname. But that I am instinctively Māori has long been a source of confusion for me and for those who have suffered to work with me. But I've come to embrace my hybridity. See, the story of discovering my Indigenous roots, it's a complex one and it's beyond the scope of this presentation. But suffice it to say, it actually involved African colleagues recognising that I thought more like them than my Western colleagues. And then... I met my biological father and I learned my Māori history and that catapulted me into a new reality. We can recount our family's origins back 22 generations to the canoe that brought us to Aotearoa, New Zealand from the Eastern Pacific Islands about 1300 years ago. And we trace our genetic history back uh, up to Taiwan actually, uh, long before that. This is my identity. This is where I'm located. This is who I am. This is the lens through which I see the world as, it's, uh, as I've sought to focus them. Intuitively, I'm indigenous, yet Western educated, and my visceral sense of things indigenous, my values and philosophies, they cause me to consistently question what I was being taught, what my teachers and most of my fellow students accepted as reality, I couldn't accept it. It didn't easily fit into how I saw the world. I found myself asking, but why? Who says? Why does it have to be this way? And who says it's this way and not another way? This is largely because I couldn't chew it alternatives. See, I, I identify as an indigenous person, as a Maori. And I identify as a follower of Jesus the Christ. I'm a student of the way as it's described in the Protestant Bible. But I'm first and foremost a Māori, or if you prefer genetic specificity, I'm a Māori of a European hybrid Māori, really. But as a Māori, I follow Jesus. And I think this is critically important as a perspective. I never cease to be genetically what I am. And I bring that into my faith experience. 
uh, even more importantly, I bring my genetic and ethnic identity with me into local expressions of the covenantal community that all followers of Christ belong to by virtue of our allegiance to him. So let's tease out, that's my identity. Let's tease out some of our identity. I think there is a prevailing myth among ethnically European followers of Jesus that we should give up our ethnic or cultural identities to follow something that's called the biblical culture. Well, according to them, this is backed up by the Apostle Paul, who said in Galatians that there is no longer a difference between one culture or the next, slave or free, male or female, for all are one. But what they refer to as biblical culture is often, or more often than not, just their interpretation of biblical culture. And besides, Paul was speaking of giving up power and dominance, not our genetic identities. You see, in Christ, we cannot cease to be who we are ethnically any more than we can cease to be our biological gender. We remain male or female. We will remain Maori or Indian. No, there's no... There's no globally homogeneous or homogeneous ideal for followers of Christ. Our unity does not demand uniformity or conformity to another's ideals. The New Testament speaks of unity in diversity, a unity in constant tension. Just like you cannot find a harmonic note on an instrument without tuned tension. So you cannot have relational harmony in a community without tuned tension identifiable diversity in the faith i think is a given at the consummation of all things there remain different nations tribes peoples and languages these diversities remain as gifts from god god manifests somewhat uniquely through every cultural expression in the world there's there's neither one that should dominate nor one that should be allowed not allowed to shape the global body of christ we need all expressions of the faith in the faith. So as a Maori, Maori follower of Jesus the Christ, the blessings I receive from God via my indigenous heritage and my perspective, I bring into his global covenantal community as blessings to be shared, to add to our collective knowledge of God in biblically authentic ways. But I need to make it known right here at the beginning that what I will share with you on our brief journey together today, uh, they're not the opinions of the organizations I work for or represent. I'm not completely divorced from that and neither are they, they but it is my contribution to a larger conversation I'm having within my spheres of influence because it's who I am and it is my offering to the global community of Christ followers. Some of you, who are a come from and who I am. And hopefully I've provided enough of a foundation for you to accept that what I have to share is trustworthy. I'm not bringing an academic presentation to you today. I'll not be citing other authors in defense of a hypothesis although they are many, but my hope is that the narrative I share will help you tell your stories of faith with authenticity, with more confidence, and with greater uh, credibility. I'd like to touch on three things uh, that I believe Indigenous people bring with us into Christ's covenant community, wherever we find ourselves. I'll spend the majority of my time exploring the issues of spirituality. And then I'll touch on stewardship and sharing as the outworking of an indigenous spiritual understanding, all of which sit under the overarching theme of reconciled relationships. Well, before I discuss these themes, let me clarify uh, some terms for you. So we'll move into a, just a short moment of definitions. So firstly, I'd like to define the term indigenous. If you don't know, it literally means of the land. So it implies a connection to a specific location. However, while 
they may be formed in a particular place. The values that are held by indigenous people uh, transcend their location of origin. Dislocated people can find it difficult to retain their identity, but it's not impossible. Our convictions and values as indigenous people continue with us uh, long after we've left the land that nurtured us or nurtured our forebears. For me, indig the indigenous or an indigenous perspective is more about a set of integrated values and, and a way of seeing the world than it is of a specific geography. In fact, I would go as so far as to refer to all collectivist oriented peoples as indigenous in my schema. Uh, there are many commonalities shared by people whose culture is still very much guided by collective priorities and responsibilities. And in contrast to indigenous, I define another part of humanity as industrial. This is predominantly, but not exclusively, the West. However, Western industrial enlightenment philosophies have so influenced politics, education, and commerce around the world that it really can no longer be geographically linked to the Euro American colonial West. See, successive generations of formerly collectivist people, educated in Western styled universities and living in urban centers, have become hybridized to industrial individualist values to some degree. So, so rather than speak of the Western world and then the majority, two thirds, developing third or non-Western world, however you want to describe the rest, highlighting their geographic, demographic or economic divisions, I look at indigenous and industrial. I really do see the world, you know, there are two types of people in the world. It's quite a bit simplistic, but not reductionistic. I see two major knowledge domains or ecosystems, the industrial and the indigenous with overlapping influence and hybridization happening between the two. A great deal of the clash in our understanding of God within Christ's worldwide covenant community exists today because of the fundamentally different ways these two great knowledge domains comprehend their realities. This clash has existed a long time. It actually it came to a head almost a thousand years ago with what historians call the Great Schism, where Western and Eastern orthodoxy separated politically. But it would be reductionistic to su suggest that all that happened because of different knowledge domains. However, I'd argue that the different perspectives of the world and therefore of God they did play a significant part in influencing actions historically that led to the split. And these are now reconverging in the conversation like we're having today. In this presentation, I will highlight how the influencing domains differ in our contemporary context, where polycentricity and cultural and religious plurality add a great deal more complexity thanks to globalization. I will not only discuss my indigenous perspective, but I'll also touch on the industrial one, just in order to draw out some contrasts. And that's not to suggest that one is entirely better than the other, for they each have their strengths and weaknesses. We need to draw out the good, call out the bad, and then counterpoint the best of each in this tuned tension to create harmony wherever they intersect in covenant communities that follow Christ. So in short, the industrial domain has developed from a fragmented perspective of reality, which sees the world largely me mechanistically as component parts with an artificial sense of autonomy, whereas the indigenous domain maintains an integrated understanding of reality, which comprehends the world as a fluid, indivisibly connected complex system. And nowhere, I believe, nowhere is this more pronounced than in the area, era, area of spirituality. And so to that we now turn. Let's first look at this contrast of Western roots. Much of what we understand about God from a Western perspective is influenced by Greek thought which ultimately developed into what we now experience as the Western 
knowledge domain. I refer to this as the industrial knowledge ecosystem or the industrial knowledge uh, domain. This knowledge domain has its roots in platonic dualism, which sees reality as a supposedly imperfect material representation separated from an unseen perfect reality. In this understanding, it is our unseen soul that is eternal, eternal and good, with our bodies being temporal, a bad copy of the real, if you like. And this is not the place to debate Greek philosophy at all, but suffice it to say, it compartmentalized reality and created a hierarchy between imperfect and perfect, between material and immaterial. And while the Greeks did not understand the spirit of God in a biblical sense, Western Christians co-opted Greek philosophy to provide them with a paradigm or a framework for thinking about God and creation. Where the spiritual is positive, and the material is fundamentally negative, or at, at best, it's useful. And this system of separated or fragmented thinking eventually led to the so-called Age of Enlightenment, which put aside the unseen, actually, and sought to remove God out of the story altogether. It focused only on matter and mind. The world is viewed as a closed system, with reason and scientific method of testing determining what is considered to be real. So the theological implications of this are broad. Uh, Western theology continued to debate the components of the faith with at least some form of communion with an internal, external God through prayer. The components of the faith were gathered and categorized in different ways by different expressions of the faith. But functionally, at least, Western theology became increasingly deist. That is, accepting the world as a material and closed system without the need for, or even the desire for, in some parts, for further communication from God or with God. For theologians with their thought games, God might as well have been absent from me mechanistic material reality. Aside from some pockets of what was derogatory, derogatively called enthusiasms, what remained was a moral cultural heritage, a set of core doctrines, and compartmentalized, albeit systematic, theologies based around Western interpretations of scripture for those who cared to understand the components of the faith in a deeper way. Well, this is, this is in a nutshell, very nutshell, this is the faith that followed the colonial powers into the indigenous world. In its evangelical expression, it was deeply sincere. It was faithful to their understanding of the Protestant Bible and convinced that faith in Jesus Christ can bring transformative change to the people's lives and by extension to their societies. And they were right, it did. But in spite of the colonial baggage that accompanied the missionary message, the growth of glo the global church today amongst an indigenous peoples proves that there was power in this proclamation. But it's not the faith of the colonial missionary that grew to become the dominant expression of covenant community on the earth today. It was the indigenized faith experience that, that grew. And this is now well established in missiology. Only as recently as the early 20th century did Western expressions of our faith see their implicit deist perspective challenged. This disruption was caused by the emergence of the Pentecostal movement in the United States and in, in Wales and England and elsewhere as it spread out, which, which developed out of this faith healing and holiness revival movements. Um, from a Western theological perspective, it was at best as if God suddenly broke in through into our reality again. At worst, it was deemed a work of the devil. You see, supernatural experiences cannot easily be comprehended, let alone explained in an industrial knowledge domain, which prioritizes cognitive knowing. Western Pentecostals still wrestle with trying to reconcile their spiritual beliefs with their industrial knowledge ecosystem. Most seem to settle for a bifurcated or a divided life living out their faith in private behind closed walls on the one hand and living out their industrialized values in the workaday world on the other. Occasionally there's overlap, but it's somewhat uncomfortable. 
But let's look at an indigenous contrast. This may seem, and what I've said probably does seem to Western as a caricature of their theology, of their perspective of scripture, etc. But our time doesn't allow me to do much more than just set it up, not as a straw man, but as a backdrop for some contrast. It is, of course, much more complex and nuanced, and history is much more rich with diversity. But my point is made, a separation from, of God from creation is deeply embedded in Western theology. But for the indigenous, however, God never left. There, there is no possibility of a separation between mind and matter, between spirit and body, between God and creation. It would be like calling something without split legumes Dao. It simply is not possible. It doesn't exist. So you can pretend God's not imminent in creation, but it is just really a pointless my game, mind game to the indigenous. However it's described, indigenous people intuitively perceive the spiritual nature of all reality, including material reality. So for indigenous people, the spiritual world is not the stuff of Hollywood or Bollywood fantasy. It's the very core of our reality. This is the dominant view of the majority of the world. It's the industrial world that is aberrant. The indigenous, as I use it in broad terms, see a spiritual life force permeating all of life and creation. Different religious systems describe the effects of this life force on reality and, and history in different ways, but the spiritual substance behind creation is still acknowledged. It's described as chi in Chinese or ki in Japanese, prana is Hindu, vijnana, Buddhist, ruach or spirit in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, baracha in Islam, ntu, a bantu uh, word, manato, a lot uh, 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 Conquian, Ni from the Lakota, Nilchuk uh, from the Navajo, bioplasmic energy, if you like, from the Euro Russian era, and mana, mana from the Melanesian world. Or for New Zealand Maori, we call it Maori. Close words, but different words. Maori, Maori. When Mo, Maori, Maori, you see it spelt there the uh, primary life force in creation. When Māori animates living things, we identify it as Māori ora, active or vital life force. This is the meaning behind a common Māori declaration, Tihe Māori ora, which exclaims, this is the source of, or the breath of life. This is vital life force. You might have noticed I, I used this before my verbal reading of scripture earlier. Well, if I mention this in many Western theological or missions contexts today, I am immediately confronted with negatively charged accusations of animism. And what they usually mean, by extension, is the worship of the created order. But you know, for indigenous, there's such an illogical leap. Animism has become this derogatory term in missions and theology associated with pantheism, the worship of many spiritual entities. But hear me now, a relationship with something does not need to imply worship. Although we could argue that some Westerners have a worshipful relationship with their material wealth or their pets or whatever. If someone wants to talk about syncretism, well, let's start there with the log in our eyes, shall we? Now, worship requires a level of allegiance where the worshipper becomes subordinate to and controlled by the object being worshipped. Taking that object to his behalf. But for followers of Christ, the only acceptable worship is of God, as revealed to us to be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who works for our good. Viewing material reality as having a spiritual connection is actually completely compatible with scripture. Jesus was not being poetic when he said the very stones would cry out if the people didn't. The wind and waves obeyed Jesus because they recognized and responded to his authority. He clearly had a relationship with created order. And as the Colossians passage I read earlier uh, indicates, he still does. 
No, it's, it's divorcing material reality from its spiritual source that is globally aberrant, objectifying creation for its materialistic utilitarian value opens it up for abuse. And we're on now, we're, we're re reaping the consequences of that abuse and even the industrialized world is seeing it. Indigenous people around the world are finally having their voices heard about their connection with and their concern for the care of creation. In New Zealand, for example, in, uh, in Aotearoa in 2017, the Whanganui River, which is pictured here, was awarded legal status as a person to protect it from human abuse. Maori tribes view themselves or ourselves and the river as part of an indivisible whole, and therefore harm to the river brings harm to, to us. And this follows the recognition in 2014 of an entire forest here as a legal entity with all the rights of a person. But we're not alone in this deep sense of connection to our environments. Ecuador in 2008, Bolivia in 2010, they established similar legislation. And in 2017, following our legal changes, the Ganga and Yamuna rivers in India were given the same rights as a human child. Well, these are rare examples, but they point to a return to a high view of creation and are the beginnings of a movement that the industrial world is finally taking note of. Identifying aspects of creation as living beings, that's one thing. But associating that, or at least here in Aotearoa, is the issue of how to relate to the spiritual beings that dwell in different habitat. Well, I follow the Bible in simply acknowledging they exist. Māori, have, my ancestors have identified them, they named them in our legends. We continue to respect their existence. Some are benevolent, some are malevolent, some can be identified as servants of God, and some are clearly against God by virtue of their destructive uh, influence, mischievous influence on human relations. There are different types and hierarchies of spiritual beings in our land and in our uh, mythos and our culture. But what are we as followers of Christ to do with such an understanding of reality? Well, firstly, I would argue we respect their existence as we respect all of God's creation. But we are not to pay homage to them or any sculpted likeness of them. And we are not to try to manipulate their power to our own ends. That is idolatry and witchcraft, which is reprehensible for the people of God. Scripture clearly warns us against building any sort of reciprocal relationship with them, but it doesn't pretend they don't exist. Now, we don't need to engage with them unless they're bothersome and destructive to human lives and relationships, in which case we are authorized as followers of Jesus to command them to cease, to desist, and to leave whenever we recognize their negative influence. But this, this applies only to terrestrial spiritual beings, those that inhabit the environments we dwell in and directly inf interfere with human relationships. We have authority over them. But in my reading of scripture, and as I've been taught, we don't have any authority over the celestial spiritual beings, the principalities, powers, and authorities that dominate regions and large systems. Tr trying to boss them around can rebound negatively on humans and even Christ followers because we overstep our authority. Now we can, however, appeal to God to intervene on our behalf as we live out our lives being transformed by the Spirit of God according to the ethics of God's kingdom, worshipping God alone in a world that continues to be influenced by the great co corruption. Well, in his letter to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul acknowledges spiritual realities and hierarchies. But you'll note that he doesn't get drawn into endless arguments about who they are or how they function. He simply puts Christ above them all. For followers of Christ, we no longer need to worry about the principalities, powers or authorities in the unseen realm, the gods, the demigods, the angels or the demons. 
for Christ rules them all and we carry his authority. It is Christ who supplies them with their very existence. Imagine that. And by the way, if you look closely, you'll see that it is Christ's likeness that features in the center of the carving that is pictured. This is the front of an altar at one of our Christ following covenantal communities here in Aotearoa. This is a carved representation of Colossians 1. Christ holds it all together. So how do we reconcile dysfunction? If indigenous followers of Jesus argue that the, the spiritual life force holding all of things together, whether spiritual or physical, is actually some form of an extension of God. Again, in the Colossians text, we see Paul arguing that it is Christ who holds all things together. And this is not some metaphorical claim. This is our lived reality. It's, it's a fair interpretation of Scripture, I believe, to believe that God's life force permeating creation is the very glory of God, which fills the whole earth, seen and unseen, as well as us. But we might be asked, how can God extend God's glory or God's self into creation corrupted by sin? To which I would answer, God's glory and God's good creation predates the curse brought upon it by the first humans. This corruption, which was imposed upon it against creation's will. Paul says as much in Romans 8. If sin, with a capital S, is viewed as a corrupting influence, rather than a set of bad behaviors to avoid, sin perhaps with a small s, uh, we can develop a much healthier relationship with creation without perceiving it as inherently bad or somehow illusory even. Creation exists and God fills it. Every culture throughout the world, throughout all time, has had to reconcile their understanding of an ideal good with their lived reality of the bad around them. This is the great human conundrum. Why is the world so bad and how can I overcome it? The biblical answer is the first humans chose rebellious self-determination, or as I call it, a will to knowledge. And, and that tainted the spiritual life force in the world, which now negatively affects all of creation and humanity as a part of it. Not that the life force itself is bad, but the spiritual filter that human will has placed on it, it creates this dysfunction that results in disruptive or disrupted relationships. And then to explain evil, evil is the amplified consequence of the imposition of human will in self-protective judgment of others, okay, fueled by a malevolent spiritual influence. influence. It is the destroyer of relationships. A Māori Anglican theologian named Māori Marsden, the same name as the, the, uh, the people, but that was his first name, Māori Marsden, he viewed this corruption in relationship terms. He said that, that Māori believed that the fabric of the universe is torn, it's, it's ripped, something went wrong, he said. He said, the damaged cosmos that we live in manifests as unreconciled relationships, as disharmony. But acting in common, uh, in common unity, for example, through singing, chanting, or collective praying, it has a harmonizing effect on our reality, repairing the damage, restoring relationships. And he was speaking of one aspect of what the New Testament writers called a ministry of reconciliation. Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the sending of the Holy Spirit was the great reconciling act that we are now to live out in service as his followers. Our covenant communities are meant to manifest and testify to the reality of this great reconciliation. We are to be reconciled to God, to each other, to our physical and spiritual environments, and to our histories. Christ sent us the Holy Spirit of the living God to provide personal power, enabling us to live it out, live out that which all other human philosophies and religions cannot achieve. 
reconciled relationships, shalom, harmony, tension and balance. Because of our immaturity in Christ, we may struggle to realize it. But the New Testament declares it is doable. In fact, this level of, of deep commitment in covenantal community is the only strategy that Jesus gave us to carry out God's mission. In Jesus' prayer of John 17, 18 to 25 particularly, he said that by a Holy Spirit-empowered supernatural unity, the world will believe and know that the Father lovingly sent the Son. Well, through my indigenous lenses, I see creation groaning under the corruptive force of sin with a capital S. That filter that corrupts the life force that sustains all things. However, Christ's obedience, death and resurrection release the Holy Spirit, not only to be with us as the comforter and to empower us to overcome personal sin, but to be the great purifier of the corrupting the corruption affecting the very life force of all creation. God achieves this through us and through our care for creation as part of our shalom uh, kingdom of God responsibilities. This is central to our mission as Christ's covenant communities throughout the world. In Romans 8, Paul makes it clear that we will not fully repair the damage this side of eternity. Nevertheless, our commitment in Christ obligates us to live in loving, reconciled relationships with our environments, even as we do so with our fellow Christ followers and our neighbors as far as it depends on us. That's a lot of time spent focused on the spirituality and reunifying it. And here's how it can work out. Here's how I want to, um, to look at the, how this indigenous view, enhanced by God's re revelation through Jesus Christ, guided by the Protestant Bible, is informing the, the Christian community as I said, and, and our mission in society. For me as an indigenous person, life seen in this way is good news indeed, because Christ has liberated me from the whims of spiritual forces and destructive relationships. I can choose differently. I can act differently, freed by the Holy Spirit. My life in Christ calls me to a higher purpose, to a sense of responsibility for God's creation, while remaining submissive to Christ as Lord, while following the lead of the Spirit of God, while maintaining mutually submissive relationships with those who form part of the covenant communities that I participate in. Living with a constant awareness of the spirit realm around us is not, it's not an imagined state of being for indigenous people. It's our lived reality. It is built into our intuition and it emerges in our daily lives as customs and values that guide all our, of our relationships, the whole of life. So as I draw to a close, I'd like to highlight just two, two practical examples of these values. These are potently endorsed by scripture. They're core to the revealed character of God. And, and they, they run counter to the pattern of this world, particularly the industrial world. So firstly, to tease out stewarding well, the first practical application is stewardship. See, stewardship is, carries connotation of, of care, connotations of care, nurture, protection and guardianship. Parents have stewardship over their children. I understand that in India, selective leaders have been placed as guardians over the, the Ganga and Yamuna rivers, seeking to protect them as one protects children. Indigenous people understand this. Um, on, on behalf of Māori, Reverend Ma, Māori Marsden put it this way, and I quote, the resources of the earth did not belong to humans but rather humans belong to the earth. Humans merely had user rights, end quote. So contrary to an industrial perspective, our dominion of creation should not imply mastery or ownership. Traditional Māori did not have a, con a concept of ownership. Everything belonged to everyone, at least 
everyone with collective authority to dwell within the tribal boundaries. Um, there were some exceptions with personal items that were reserved for private use, like garments, your clothing, uh, weapons that you used, or combs. Uh, but other than that, everything was shared for mutual benefit and was cared for to ensure resources were available for successive generations. At least that was, was the ideal. But for followers of Jesus, we look back to our Genesis narrative to detect our original purpose. That is a responsibility to populate and be guardians of or to use and care for God's good creation. Sadly, humans by and large rebelled against this purpose. Creation has been abused in the pursuit of power. And by implication, so has the creator. Abuse is not unique to those within the industrial knowledge domain. Uh, given the opportunity, those within the indigenous domains can, can too easily pursue dominance over others and their habitats. My own history testifies to that. The sin corruption influences all equally. Nevertheless, our Genesis responsibility remains. We are to steward the resources we have access to with the aim of perpetual sustainability. If we extract for our own use, we need to replenish. This is the principle of reciprocal relationship, to release and to receive, to share for mutual benefit. Abuse in any relationship can be defined by the lack of reciprocity. Abuse is the imposition of power to control and extract without mutual benefit. Abuse in a marriage relationship, for example, is one where the one spouse dominates the other, treating the other as property which they own, to profit from, to gratify their selfish desires. Well, the same applies to businesses, governments, communities. They are abusive if there, if there is no truly mutual benefit for all involved. Well, no wonder all of creation groans for the children of God to be revealed. It's groaning under abuse. As followers of Christ, it's our collective stewardship responsibility to replenish the environment, even as we are to benefit our societies with loving, compassionate responses to societal needs. This is part of our mission in the world. And similarly, I've already mentioned sharing, but similarly, uh, stewardship and sharing, they go together. My indigenous perspective sees ownership actually as an act of greed. It's a withholding. Whether it is private ownership as promoted by capitalism or state ownership as promoted by communism, ownership pursues power and control. And it is ultimately unjust and abusive. Ownership in some form or another is the pattern of this world, and it's, it's just very difficult to perceive how it could be any different. But Christ's covenant communities are called and empowered to be different. We are called to share. In God's kingdom, we own nothing. It all belongs to the Creator, as do we. We see this powerfully illustrated in St. Luke's second piece of now in what we commonly call the book of acts in the book of acts chapter 4 verses 32 to 35 luke wrote this all believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own so they shared everything they had the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the lord jesus and god's blessing was upon them all there were no needy people among them because all those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. There was no impoverished people in their midst. Can you imagine? The historic record suggests that this co cooperative sharing system was not without its problems, but it set a precedent that all followers of Jesus should take seriously. I ask the question, in what ways can we live counter to the pattern of this world and follow the intuition of indigenous peoples to hold all things in common and use them for mutual benefit and long-term sustainability? 
for sure. This takes wise governance, and sin and malevolent forces will always be at work to undermine this witness of God's goodness. But that should not stop us from working towards greater mutuality and reciprocity in Christ as covenantal communities throughout the world. But, but the ideal is not some secluded community like a monastery or an ashram where we close ourselves off from the world. No, no, we should live this out in public as a testimony to the power of God, a living example within our cities, our suburbs, towns and villages. See, this is what it means to be light and salt, not in some individualistic sense, but together as a localized collective. Our gospel declaration of God's goodness should be an explanation of the demonstration of God's goodness in our Christ-centered covenantal communities. And so that all of society can benefit from it, not just us. The gospel is not made up of abstract conceptual propositions. An authentic gospel witness must be lived out and seen and experienced as well as heard. To most people, this probably sounds like an unattainable pipe dream. But a friend and mentor of mine from New Zealand, Dr. Viv Gregg, is a specialist in urban leadership who teaches an economic system that can be used powerfully with covenantal communities committed to mutuality and reciprocity. And he calls it cooperative economics. It's beyond the scope of this presentation to discuss such things here, but suffice it to say, he drew some understanding of this economic system from collectivist welfare values of Māori, of my cultural background. Embedded in our culture exists concepts like manaakitanga, which literally means to lift up or elevate the dignity or honour of another person. Manaakitanga manifests hospitality and generosity of welfare for others and sharing, not just for the tribe, for the insiders, but also for the stranger, for, for those on the periphery, for the outsiders. Well, this is motivated by the principles of afi and aroha. Well, afi to us means to surround or embrace, and it's inclusive, protective, and it has nurturing implications. Aroha is our word for loving kindness and grace. In Hawaiian, it's aloha. You may be more familiar with that. We are a common language in the Pacific, uh, Eastern Pacific. But for us, it's aloha. And uh, this beautifully expresses a deep affection that we desire to see in all of our relationships, both with people and our environments, the spiritual world, the lot. Sharing is an expression of aroha, of love, trust, and commitment. For Joy, a dear friend and colleague uh, from India, the leader of an international missions organization, he questions whether generosity is actually a biblical concept. He reasoned uh, that for us to be generous, we first need to own something in order to give it away. But the Bible, if the Bible says that all we have is God's, then we really own nothing. We're just caretakers of what God has entrusted to us. We're stewards. Therefore, we cannot be generous because it's not ours to give. We can only share what God has provided us with. Owners give, stewards share. Well, this may sound like semantics, just toying with definitions of English words, but words describe reality. And I believe what Bajoy was articulating is a a biblically mandated indigenous perspective. In conclusion, for Māori, all of these concepts I refer to are wrapped up in a concept of whānau, uh, which means family, but it can express deep abiding and caring relationships with people or creation, as well as with our history with our ancestors. And this need not mean inappropriate reverence or worship, but it does mean an implicit sense of connection or belonging to something as core to an understanding of who we are, of our identity. And this is why I begin any talk that I give by locating myself and connecting my identity with the Lake Wairarapa region where I grew up 
and where my tribal links remain. That is the environment that nurtured me. My tribal river, the Ruamahanga, is where I was baptized as a believer in Christ. The hills that look over my township are a part of me. I remain connected to them in a meaningful way as one feels connected to an old friend. This is my indigenous spiritual reality. I am connected. I am responsible. I need to be faithful, to steward well, and to share uh, widely. As we all know, relationships take a lot of effort to maintain. We get hurt and we hurt in return. These are the effects of big S sin. But Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit empowers us to give way, to humble ourselves, to repent, to seek forgiveness from one another, and to forgive. We're to dwell in Christ in covenant communities with mutuality and reciprocity. We are to serve one another and seek the good of each other. Then the world will believe and know that the Father lovingly sent the Son. This is the way of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, follow it into all the world. Be fruitful and multiply, manifesting God's glory everywhere, always. Amen. Thank you, Jay, for your wonderful presentation. It, it crossed the, the time limit, but it, it, um, it, uh, it feels this is uh, just one or two minutes. Thank you so much. Before I invite the Dosongrom Basumatri to Respond to paper. This, I just want to share a, a thought. Thank you for uh, giving us sort of um, um, an example that you yourself, your people, have already taken and experienced. This part of India, Christianity is about 1,000 years old, um, and still it somehow distances from our culture identity, making us think that if you follow Christ, then you leave your culture. But you're telling us that follow Christ with your culture, because Christ never leave you. That is powerful, helpful. Thank you so much. Now, we will now <clears throat> invite Dr. Songram to respond to the paper. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, queries, please use the chat box. Dr. Songram, please. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you. Uh, yeah, as Jay said, I think our uh, brother Lamboy has overstated while introducing me as well. I'm just an ordinary countryside uh, man, okay? not a theologian. That's repre representing our people with small voices. Yeah, so greetings from Chennai, where I live. Uh, college, Gurukul Western Theological College and Research Institute. Uh, time is very short. I won't take much time. Quickly, I will highlight some of the key points that Jay has presented, and then we will have the common discussion. By the way, <clears throat> how amazing it is that we are one as indigenous, Jay. As well as we are one 
as Christians or followers of Christ. Brother, after reading your paper, I was amazed how close we are in terms of our worldview, in terms of all our cultural life and lived realities, what you have expressed here as well in your lecture. So it's uh, very, very amazing. So I also would like to just uh, bring in something which is very, very similar to Maori cultures and worldviews. Yeah, few things. But before that, word of appreciation, eh? It is well researched well well crafted uh, paper so first of all well progressed presentation from one step to the other and then well directed introduction and then well set objective and then well defined concepts and frameworks you said it is not the academic but it is truly an academic yeah, well resourced one so Again, well-explored contents, and then examples, very fitted examples, and then well-exposited biblical foundations. And then finally, well-justified theological arguments in your presentation. So thank you, Zay. Now, let me just highlight a few things. What impressed me most in Jay's presentation is the dialectic between my identity and our identity, what Lamboy has just said his thought. And then question comes to us as tension. Am I, I am Boro by the way, ah, Lamboy is Cookie, Jay is Maori. And according to Jay, yes, I am Maori first, and then Christian. I am cookie first, then Christian. I am borrow first, then Christians. Rather, it is not the Christian Maori, Maori Christian, or cookie Christians, or Christian cookie, whatever way. By the way, we have tension on this. Which comes first? But they start with this, yes, gospel does not remove our identity or our ethnic identity, our own identity, but rather gospel help us to enjoy our identity in Christ amidst diversity. So that is uh, beautiful. And then the epistemic location Jay has brought really, really struck my mind. Two locations, epistemic location, yes. One is industrial, other one is indigenous. Very beautifully explored. And then to his key presentation of true spirituality, uh, to, um, uh, through which spirituality we follow Christ, in that he has beautifully explored and which is very, very common with us as well. I am putting it uh, like 3D, hmm, 3G, 4G, 5G. Here comes in Z, 3S, 3S, spirituality, stewardship, and sharing. And then within each section, J has very beautifully explored what exactly is this spirituality is by bringing into tension what the dominant Christian faith that came from, that is from Greco-Roman worldviews, particularly on the Platonic philosophy, where there is the dualism. Always one is in tension with the other. That uh, we know that that comes from there. So beautifully set into tension. And then finally, highlights, particularly from the indigenous epistemic location, that where reality is undivided, in unseparated whole. 
where the sacred and secular are what and then rather there is no secular in reality all are secret oh sacred let me read uh, one uh, things which is there commonly used some of, by some of our tribal theologians in this year's theologian here in northeast india very beautifully done like land you have art land you have explored land is the space of course it is not mere space but land is the space where god dwells here it is and then this land is sacred now someone said god said to moses the place on which you are standing is holy ground and then in tribal world the whole land is a holy ground a place of communion with god spirit nature and with the members of society it is a temple a dwelling place of gods and spirits and this is the place where they are worship not in human made temples by the way in indigenous medicinal wisdom this village medicine men and women they have no place to do toilet very interesting because everywhere there is sacred god's providence all things are medicine if you do toilet or pass excreta somewhere upon something now you are defiling the ground so beautiful wisdom now with that also they has very beautifully highlighted what this spirituality is exactly that is in maori cultures and maori traditions it is in the stewardship or taking care of the art or the world that spirituality is fully written and then he has said about the stewarding this as well stewarding well the resources of the earth does not belong or do not belong to human but rather human belongs to earth now this is also very much prevalent concept and understanding among the indigenous people of northeast india land belongs to god and then we belong to god but uh, yeah and we belong to land but land does not belong to us and then since land is the mother of all, all source for all our livelihood and living so is land where god dwells very beautifully connected concepts with the maori cultures and tradition and then another lastly sharing that concept is very much in the heart of the indigenous culture of northeast india as well we have quite a lot of concept here right now here where bki is situated kanko is the ethical or spiritual principles where everything is encompassed and then which ethical values or moral values spiritual values of uh, inculcated in our living there is peace justice prosperity and harmony among all this is very very beautiful so sharing is one of the best best cultural values or spiritual values among this indigenous community here as well because there are quite a lot of concepts we have on this uh, share and then some of the practices are by the way diminishing because of what jay says that industrial uh, ecosystem or industrial epistemic knowledge so because of quite a lot of influence from outside or what we call it generally western some of those values are diminished 
For example, in terms of this sharing, there are sayings in many cultures in our region. Like food eaten alone is not tasty. Right? Food eaten alone is not tasty. Anything tasty food, we share. We cannot resist sharing. That's why here also among the Kuki tribes, as well as in my tribe and other tribes here in Manipur and Assam or other states here. Suppose like we go to the hunting. So I get a very nice deer. Okay. Then I sort it, bring it. I will not eat alone. I will distribute to all. To neighboring families. Okay. This was the culture. Now in that some of the beautiful expression of what the indigenous culture or spiritual values we had. Let me read one of the quotation. Uh, rather, it is a bit long. It may take uh, two, three minutes, I think. Then I will try to conclude. Of course, this was said by one of the right hand of the Naga freedom fighter. His secretary or right hand, Saki Takri. Takri or Saki Takri. So he wrote this one. Very beautiful. I'm real, I was really impressed when I first came across this uh, saying. Let me read for you. We are all equal. Men and women have equal so social status. We have no caste distinction, no high and low class of people. We believe in that from a form of government which permits the rule not on the majority but of the people as a whole. We govern ourselves by a government which does not govern at all. Then in the life of the village, the family is a permanent institution, a conscious unit polity. Every family is proud of its own and no family has ever been left by their fellow men or women to the mercy of circumstances. Possessing its own house, built on its own land, no family ever pays any tax. Forest and woodlands, rivers belongs to the people. We cultivate as much land as we need or desire, and there is no one to question our rights. We have food to eat and drinks, drinks to drink excessively beyond our needs. Truly, God has been good to us. Three square meals a day. Ju means rice wine, rice beer. Without measure, we have no beggars. Every family lives in its village. It has no landlords to harass it and no revenue collector to knock on its doors. For the family is master of its own affairs. And wonder of wonders, we have no jail prison. We have no jail. We do not arrest nor even imprison anyone. Our civil authority is God in the matter of life and death. And murder is very rare. We fear nobody, individually or collectively. We are healthy people and fear corrupts the health of man. What peace we have? No police, no CID. We use no lock, our grave outside the village, and no guard is ever needed, for there is no one to steal them. We travel as we like, and we cost, it costs nothing. Wherever we go, it is our home. If by ill fortune somebody falls sick or dies, he or she is born home to his, her family, without counting the cost. We talk freely, 
live freely and often fight freely too. We have no inhibitions of any kind. Sometimes wild, but free. Very, very beautiful expression. And then this talks all about the community. Spirit of community, which community, according to our indigenous belief here as well, God, spirits, human beings, nature, creature, all live together. And that makes the whole cosmocentric living. Rather, it is very, very opposite of anthropocentric view of all world, as well as reality, as well as all God's salvation. Now, few issues when we reflect in this way, when we highlight indigenous uh, knowledge and construct or formulate our theologies, there are few issues we encounter. One of the things I have already said, am I Boro, Kuki, a Maori? And then if we say, yes, I am, what happens to Christian identity? That tension is always set. Even I encountered quite a lot of questions when I was giving some uh, uh, talk to various people on tribal challenge. How do we really reconcile? Yes, Christ does not uh, diminish our ethnicity, culture, and all. But where we are fighting in the name of our ethnic identity, where do we stand? Whether the gospel has power to reconcile this ethnic tension. In that, I always say of uh, uh, one Jayeshalan, by the way, here from Chennai itself, like the blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of Jesus. That tension. Now, secondly, now are we romanticizing of our past glory? This is another question that comes to us. Are not these the things of the past? Because after becoming Christians, many of these things we have given up. Now, this is a challenge, by the way. Can we go back? Is the question. And then are we, by exploring those things, merely indigenizing or ethnicizing or, in other words, tribalizing? Is this ethnicization or tribalization of gospel? This is another question I myself encountered a number of times. This is a serious. Now, why do to follow inherited Christian traditions as it is, as normative, or follow the mother tradition? In that, we have a tension of whether it is synthesis or syncretism. What do we do between these two cultures? And then finally, of course, this is my claim as well. Was not there gospel before gospel came to indigenous soil? Were not there gospel? in the indigenous world before gospel came to them. And if it is so, what is this gospel? And if I understood correctly Jay's presentation, all this indigenous knowledge system and then spirituality, stewardship, sharing, whatever, that spirituality is the gospel of Christ, which can build a harmonious community. With that, I'm concluding. Let us have some other common discussion as well. Thank you, Lambusa, and thank you, Zay, one again for your beautiful presence.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Songram. Please do not go away. Yeah, I will be here only. <laughs> um, yes, uh, has uh, raised three questions. The first question, I want to uh, put it in the context of currently India and add one more. Um, we are now in the process of making India as one culture, uh, one religion, one nation. So very soon we will hear words like this. Can I, how can I be um, a cookie, then a Hindu and a Christian? Hindu, cookie, Christian, cookie, Hindu. Is it possible? So this question I also put back to Dr. Songram um, for, for because uh, we reflect on this and all of you. Um, if India continues to develop further, trying to make everyone as one culture, we have to find the way to uh, find ourselves room within their um, proposed uh, nationalist identity. So how do we do that? Uh, so when you try to answer or reflect on the questions, please, uh, if you can take into those questions uh, aspect uh, into your reflection. Um, there's also uh, one uh, question in the chat box. This is from Anand. Um, he's, he's saying, when you say Hindu, are you referring to people group or Indian or religious group? Okay. Now, this is a question to me. Um, okay. Now, making India as a Hindu nation, according to the Hindu Tua, which is a, the political doctrine, um, again, Hindu Tua is different from Hinduism, which is a religion, but somehow they have come one because of Hindu nation. So we need to find before some people say, okay, I'm a Christian Hindu or a Hindu Christian. But it's going to be very different now, difficult now, because there will not be a room for any other identity. This is Hindu or, or an Indian Hindu, according to Hindu to ideology. So, so this is where I think we have to find a new um, extra responsibility or place for our where we, we could stand in the land that currently we call it India or Indian. So, so please, uh, if you can show some lights on that, so it'd be uh, helpful. And uh, for his the second, uh, second question, I think I would uh, also ask James to reflect on the whole issue of um, uh, this uh, syncretism and all that, because you talk about those things in your uh, last lecture uh, before, so uh, I'll come to you later. Yeah, Jay, if you want to reflect on those questions, please. Uh, Dr. Songram, are you going to speak to the, uh, the Indian issue? <laughs> Yes, go ahead. So whether, whether Christian Maori or Maori Christian? You said you're Maori Christian. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think if re reflecting back to the India Hindu Christian, if Hindu is a nationalistic title, I, I would have to understand what, what means by Hindu if it's not Hinduism and whether they require you to subscribe to the beliefs of Hinduism. Um, but I am, I am a New Zealand, uh, a Maori Christian living in New Zealand and I, I identify as a New Zealander as well. So my national identity is what we would call Aotearoa New Zealand, which is the Maori reference to, to New Zealand. And, uh, and I have, if we, everybody living within a state has to live within the parameters of that state. 
And obviously there, there are parameters, state parameters that are antagonistic to the people who follow Christ because there's another majority religion and we would consider them to be persecuted because there isn't religious, religious freedom. But if there is religious freedom prom promised under a Hindu nation, uh, is it possible to be a Christ follower Hindu in terms of the national identity rather than the religious allegiance? That would be my question mm -hmm. to try to tease that out. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the us Westerners have not got a clue really about what it means, <laughs> most of us, the word Hindu. I mean, the, the word Hinduism is an imposition on you by the colonials. So, you know, the, even mm -hmm. Hinduism doesn't really exist it, in many ways, <laughs> similar to Maori. Maori in our language just means normal. So <laughs> when we talk about the Maori, we're talking about uh, a diversity of tribes. So I'm Ngāti Kahunganu, with a mix of Ngāti Pro and Kaitahu, three big tribal systems, but I'm not, I mean, to the rest of the world, I say I'm Māori because it's easier to understand, but I'm, my identity is actually Ngāti Kahunganu because when I relate within this nation of then they're all asking, who is your father and who are your family and how do you connect and can I trust you? <laughs> this tribalism is, is within that, but to the outside world, they just see one uh, homogenous group when, when it's not. And um, similarly, with the, all the religious beliefs under Hinduism, it's a convenient title, isn't it? But it doesn't adequately express the complexity that you're living with. And I'm very suspicious of, and this is my post-colonial uh, bias, I'm very suspicious of external impositions of, of names and categories and definitions and understandings. And I think that the, the global, what I call the, um, the covenantal communities, the global covenantal communities need to allow the indigenous to express and identify themselves rather than critique what they think. One of my profs in my doctoral program, he said, syncretism is just somebody else's how you express your belief. And uh, I found that compelling. It's an outsider's perspective of your faith. And I would equate that to original sin. I say that sin is a knowledge, a power to knowledge, a, a will to knowledge, sorry, a, a power that you're imposing on somebody else. And, and we need to get over that and allow people to self-identify. Yes, Lamboy, you want me to say something? Yeah? Please. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like what Lamboy has said is if you spit up, it falls on you. <laughs> so I was raising question. Now Lamboy asked me to answer. <laughs> no. uh, okay, anyway. Now, by the way, uh, this is the reality with us, particularly from Nordisk now. We have multiple identities to maintain. Rather hybrid identity kind of thing. With the eyes of the mainstream India, rather we are not India. By the way, this is another political uh, issue. Now, if we take religious line, right? Now, we are not Indian as well, because we are a Christian in that uh, lens of the whole this uh, Hindu uh, national Odyssey. But just to tell this one, if we go to the core of the what Hinduism is in true meaning, which is Dharma, there there is no tension, by the way. Within Hin among the Hindu scholars also, and then that first original Hinduism, there is no tension. But later developed Hinduism is the tension. Now in that, particularly for the indigenous people, some of these value systems we are talking about now within this uh, indigenous epistemology location, quite 
lot of these values, which we call it dharma, according to Hinduism, is this dharma only. And then, by the way, what all Christian gospel values, we are talking the kingdom values, are these dharmas. For that reason, we have quite a lot of things in the Indian Christian theological reflection that there is nothing tension in that level. But when we come to the religion, so much explicit religion level, there we have the problem. Now, this is really a, a difficult, difficult situation, by the way, as Lamboy now said. Now, all kinds of things, the one nation, one religion, all those things. For Nordist India, it is all the more complex. Now, this is why I was asking, if I claim my ethnic identity, what happens next? In our locality there in Nordist itself is one, where we are not one, fighting each other. This is one situation. Then, while fighting with the greater enemy, again, what happens with my religion identity now as a Christian? If I fight with this greater enemy, the Hindu Twa, then it is another serious, serious tension. So we need wisdom for this. For this reason, I always uh, just say when we reflect on this, that we have to fight with our moral, our spirituality, not with anything else. And that spirituality is, as Jay presented, very compatible with the gospel spirituality. That's what I would say. If we fight with this, I think there won't be much resistance. Because it is compatible with the real Hindu, Hinduism, that is Dharma as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, I would like to um, invite uh, Dr. James, um, if you would like to comment anything on this, particularly on the issue of uh, syncretism and all that. Um, uh, James has, has a long uh, experience in Africa, a, a tribal situation in Africa, about 30 years or so. Also. And so he has a rich experience in this field. So it'd be uh, good for us to hear from him. Uh, James, if you can, please. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Jay, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I'm not sure I am at all in a good position to to de determine what syncretism is. Um, I think that really always needs to be a conversation with local people as they live into the Word of God and discern as a community what it means to be faithful. Um, but maybe rather than making a pronouncement, I would just ask a question. Um, when I hear your question of indigenous worldview, um, it sounds very close to biblical, biblical shalom. So the, the holistic uh, understanding of God in the world and what God desires for the world in reconciling all things to himself in Christ. Uh, when I hear a description of the industrial world, which is quite associated with the West and which in many ways brought Christianity to different parts of the world, um, it sounds quite distant from the biblical shalom that, um, that we have presented to us in the scriptures. So the question I would come back to, and it relates to syncretism or how one understands culture and gospel. Uh, the question is, what does the gospel of Christ actually bring to indigenous culture? Uh, I think uh, Sungaram was raising the question, was there a gospel before the gospel came? <laughs> uh, and, and so my question in the context of the Maori is, what is 
the value? What is the good news that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings to traditional indigenous Maori culture? Uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear you just reflect on that. Um, if someone from outside your, your culture asks you that question, how do you respond to something like that? Why would you want to be a Christian in the first place? What's the advantage? <laughs> yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, Jay, a question to you is, um, yeah, who, who, who helped your people until the first missionary came to your place? Yeah. What, what they only got gospel. If, the, if, that, if, there is, if there was, what was that gospel look like? And that will, that will be also our, our, the issue that we have to, uh, question that we have to answer here as well. Thank you. It's a very pertinent question. And uh, it really does lie at the heart of why in the 1850s, uh, nearly 80% at best, best guess, there was at least 60% of Maori were attending church. Um, and we, we think about 80% had to huge people movement. Uh, the, um, again, mentor Maori Marsden um, is quoted as saying, before the missionaries came, we saw the foot of the mountain. And we, we engaged with the mountain, but we only saw the foot. When they brought the Bible in our language, the cloud lifted off the mountain and we saw the whole mountain. So I, we saw in part, but mm -hmm. now we understand the whole and we understand how everything fits in. And, and by and large, the people movement here was by the younger, uh, particularly younger men, but also women who got hold of, of scripture, who, who were taught to read and then understood the spiritual power that, that the scripture was promising in the gospel. And you have to understand indigenous peoples. We, we had a very strong oppressive shaman system here in the, in the priestly order. And a lot of uh, what we would consider in the West Gnostic knowledge, a lot of secret knowledge that was locked away by, by very strict pathways and protocols you, you couldn't access. But the gospel broke that open, broke that wide. And young people were discovering that, you know, Jesus gave them both freedom, as I expressed it myself, gave me freedom from the spiritual forces that I was sensing around me that I couldn't understand or comprehend. And when I came to Christ, suddenly they all, the whole cos cosmos went, came into alignment and I understood Christ as supreme uh, very early on in my faith. And I immediately lost my fear of the unseen realm. It was, it was endemic. So um, where previously I would have gone in a, in my uh, ancestors would have gone to uh, what we call a tohonga. In, in fact, my great grandfather was a tohonga, a, a shaman priest, mm -hmm. uh, quite a powerful one by all accounts. And so you would go to them and they would give you talismans or artifacts or sayings to appease the spirit so you could feel at peace. Uh, but Christ gave that to people without the intermediary and that spread like wildfire. And, and, you know, we talk about Pentecostalism these days, but the stories of, uh, you know, demon possession, people being freed, of whole regions, warfare stopping because of uh, supernatural intervention, of angelic visitations, of um, healings um, and, and supernatural events, were, it's, it's quite powerful. So that spiritual aspect, uh, the gospel speaks freedom, total freedom there in ways that I say, um, I, I mentioned about, we have these cognitive propositions, these abstract concepts that we articulate from Western theology. But this was visceral, uh, real life uh, liberation. The captives were freed and the oppressed were set free. The, um, you know, the broken hearted were bound up. It was, it's the Isaiah and the Luke 4 
thing of Jesus. So th that Christ coming is the gospel. We may have, have seen the foot of the mountain and we, we have values that are biblical. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they were, they were gospel because um, they were satisfactory or they were holding space until Jesus came mm. and lifted the cloud. Thank you, Jay. Um, I think um, we are nearing to uh, three o'clock, uh, two hours. Um, we have we have two uh, church leaders uh, with us. One is Reverend Viel, I think this left, and and the other one is uh, Bishop Pautang. Um, um, can we, if we if we have to answer the question that was put to uh, Jay? What would be the answer for us, um, Bishop Bautang, if you want to reflect on? Um, who, who helped us, our ancestors, from the cave, which we, we said the beginning of our people? Um, who would be the person, who would be the, who's, who's, I mean, what would be the one that will um, take care of us, took care of us until the first missionary came to Manipur or among us? Any idea you want to share? Is Bishop Pautang available? Or anyone else? Okay, I think he's not, he's, I think he's not um, maybe the way. Um, well, before we close, um, anyone want to say anything related to the, the topic uh, today? And uh, particularly um, Jay and Dr. Songram, if you want to have a last uh, word, uh, you're welcome to do um, before we close. Anyone else? Jay or Dr. Songram and anyone else? Uh, John, if you want to say anything. I wonder if I could just uh, express appreciation for someone who had to fight, as it were, to get out of the industrial world on meeting Christianity in Jesus. It's taken me um, many of my 60 over years as a Christian to realize um, how big the mountain is. And uh, there are still more clouds to lift from it for me. But one big step was to realize that God had been at work widely in everyone. And I think the day that I realized that God created everyone, so that everyone has a lot in common with me, because that's the way God made me, in the sense of being able to learn from others who were very different. So thank you very much, especially today. Thank you, John. Uh, for those of you who, who um, yeah, Lamboy, shall um, I say last time, last um, line? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll give you a good chance. Uh, John, John um, is a well-known. Um, if you if you read uh, books, if you are someone who reads a lot of books, it is possible that your the book that you read was proved read by John. <laughs> so 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 he's the person who does proof reading. PhD thesis and all that. So thank John for your, your word of encouragement and all the insight. Yeah, Dr. Songram, please. Just one line. This is my uh, faith and conviction as well. So, the gospel is at home in our culture. And then our culture is at home in the gospel. That is why we embrace Christianity as religion, but not as religion but as the gospel. Thank you. With, yeah, with that beautiful sum up that uh, the, the Dr. Ram has um, given, so we will close uh, this uh, public lecture. As I mentioned, this is the first uh, international public lecture of BKI. And we're so grateful to God and to all of you, particularly to Jay and Songram uh, for um, presenting your thoughts 
your experiences, also giving us a direction where to go, where to look for, and um, how to proceed. So thank you so much. And we also thank James and John and many others. I, I saw John and many others for, for joining us from afar and for, uh, distance. Um, we are hoping that we will have another uh, lecture. Um, so uh, we will announce it uh, when the time comes. Um, so we will love to hear, have you again for this common enrichment and discussion and sharing. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. And please use the, um, uh, now we have the email and we will um, contact you uh, whenever possible and uh, we will appreciate your cooperation and continue sharpening our mind and our spirit as we, as we live these two together, our identity and faith. So thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you.